Those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rosa, and I am the head of talent experience here at Andela. Basically, what that means is that uh, I look after our talent from the end to end of your journey with us, from the time you apply to when you might work with some of our clients. Um, but today, I actually have a, a very privileged honor uh, of speaking with our amazing guest, Elena. Um, so, Elena, welcome to the Andela community it's so great to have you thank uh, you yeah it's brilliant I can't wait for our conversation so um, I'm sure many of you when you were signing up this webinar you read a little bit about Elena so she's the she's the co-founder and CEO of Women Who Code who are a phenomenal organization one that I have really really admired um, and Women Who Code have now grown to serve um, nearly 300,000 members which is just extraordinary um, across 134 countries so similar to Nigeria or similar to Andela we have people all over the world, similar to Nigeria. Um, uh, Elena holds a, a master's in uh, organizational management and an MBA. She's an angel investor, venture uh, partner at Valier Ventures, and is on the board of ATLF Family Meal. And she also teaches women lead in Georgia State University. So highly accomplished. <laughs> I know, can't wait to get digging into that. Um, and we're really, really excited to have you here. Uh, so how this will be today is we're, I'm going to chat with Lena and we're going to ask her some questions. But as I said, do feel free to pop into the Q&A and uh, join in as we go through. So welcome. Thank you. I'm um, honored to be here and uh, so honored that uh, people around the world are, are joining us here. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what types of questions come in with the chat at the end. Yeah, absolutely. It's always uh, always an array. And I love seeing everybody uh, posting where they're from and saying hello in the chat. It's really amazing to have you all here mm -hmm. tonight. So Elena, let's start with your journey in technology. Um, mm -hmm. What do you recall maybe as like your first kind of time that you got interested or had that spark around coding, technology, digital products? You want to tell us a little yeah. bit about that? So um, kind of a, a pivotal moment is what I'm going to hone in on um, because it came up about later on in my career. I'd actually started off um, my career more on the traditional side of uh, the industry. And so certainly I'd encountered uh, technology and um, had a, a couple of sort of smaller projects up until that point. But, um, you know, San Francisco was one of these places that was just on my list of if you get a chance to move there, go for it. And so um, uh, a little over a year after I had graduated with my MBA, I had the opportunity uh, to move to San Francisco. And so the answer was yes. Um, but when I got out there, even though I'd had a really strong um, career up until that point in kind of the traditional uh, business world, um, I had started off my career working at Puma in Germany and then went to work for a small women's performance footwear company um, and then, you know, went out there and the reaction was kind of, um, you know, you're not coming from Google, you're not coming from Facebook, you know, you're not coming from uh, Microsoft, um, you know, Puma, who, who's that? And it was just such a surprise to me. I, I realized I actually did need to uh, adjust my, my skills to be able to um, meet the market. And that's something that I've really carried forward in my vision around if you want to be a leader in the world now and in the future, you're going to be leading a technology company. You need to understand software engineering. You need to have a coding background. So when I moved out to the Bay Area and realized it took me a little while to realize that I was struggling to find my my path in the tech industry. Um, I uh, learned how to code. I started spending time within the community. I started spending time with smart women excited about um, technology, and I realized I was having a blast. And um, and then at one point, I realized, hey, actually, this is important because I started to see that fewer than 5% of women were getting top technology roles like CTO, vice president of engineering. Um, and that was to me just 
a big point of opportunity. And I start, I like Women Who Code was kind of a, a local community group at the time in, in uh, San Francisco. Um, and it made me realize actually honing in on what it takes to go from being a software engineer to follow your path, stay in your career and make it to um, the highest level that you want to go in your uh, career is actually something that uh, women need uh, support with. And so I started learning uh, from uh, people who were in CTO, vice president of engineering, uh, technical co-founders of, of, you know, top funded startups and started weaving that in to the program offerings at, at Women Who Code. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think a lot of this is about, uh, actually, women are the biggest consumers, I think, of technological projects and products. And as you said, like, in the world that we live in, the most impact that you're going to have in your career is working in the technology field. And it's kind of being a creator, not a consumer. And so understanding mm -hmm. technology can only bring you further. But that's um, so inspirational. And yeah, having been in San Francisco, I think that energy, I could see how that would just inspire you to drive you forward for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so this this conversation that we're having is actually part of Andela's like International Women's Day uh, events. And the theme this year is about breaking the bias. Yeah, <laughs> it's about breaking the bias. And, and I guess I want to like talk a little bit more personally about, you know, like you, you breaking the bias in your own in your own career. And, you know, what obstacles have you faced and how did you break through them? Do you have any tips for our audience about that? Yeah, um, so I, I think there's a, a lot of bias around, um, you know, women in, in leadership roles. And I've come up against things that are seemingly small, but when they happen over and over again, um, it, it makes it um, harder for you to accomplish what you need to accomplish in your role. So I've, I've had multiple times um, people ask, you know, like, uh, like, how do you know um, you should be the one to be the CEO, um, or um, when I'm, you know, opening up a, a, a business banking account, the person who's setting up the account saying, you know, you you have to reach this level of uh, investment to be able to do it. I'm like, I'm running a real company. <laughs> um, we can proceed here, um, and you know, also being being told, you know, either your too direct or you're too emotional or you're not emotional enough. And these are, um, you know, types of things that, you know, the, the 22 year old founder, you know, like that stereotypical legendary 22 year old founder probably doesn't even get asked. And so when, if, if I, who am caring for a lot of business experience, um, uh, I'm a co-founder in the organization and, and coming up against these barriers, you can imagine that, um, you know, people who either have this or have less um, are, are encountering just as much or, um, or um, you know, even, even stronger bias than, than I've faced in, in my career. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of a lot of biases that that we need to uh, to tear down, and a, a lot that I face. And I think you know, there's there's only time to hone in on on one or two of them. Um, otherwise, we could we could have a, a conversation all day about the the biases that exist in the world um, for each of us. For sure, and I think it like yeah, as you said, it's those little micro kind of comments or actions that you notice over time like building up and like how do you how do you approach that like how do you keep a mindset that's kind of positive or or how do you in the day-to-day -day, you know start to think about overcoming those biases that are kind of you're noticing over time right yeah um it, it's not easy um uh, almost the smaller it is the harder it is to externalize and realize that it's actually a, a social or cultural issue that needs to change and not a failure in yourself. And um, so I'm naturally kind of a, a solution oriented, optimistic person. And um, I would say, you know, one of the, the key things to, to succeeding for um, 
someone who's building an organization is is grit, uh, the ability and the willingness to continue pushing forward because there are amazing high highs, but um, there's a lot of just steadies and their lows and you have to keep going in, in those moments. And so um, while, you know, getting to be here today and um, and talk to the Andela community is certainly a high high. Um, you know, you're also the person who uh, takes care of of everything else. Um, and so it, it really is um, staying staying focused, believing in in what you uh, do, remembering your why um, and and um, you know continuing to push forward that that uh, that grit and perseverance. Yeah, I love that. Remembering your why and like reinforcing that constantly is absolutely something that I think like having that purpose behind can just keep you going. So yeah, totally agree. Um, amazing. So one of the big reasons we wanted to have you here is that you are the co-founder, as you mentioned, and CEO of uh, Women Who Code. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, what's the origin story uh, behind getting Women Who Code started? As you said, it was like a local kind of chapter in San Francisco mm -hmm. and and how that's grown over time. Would love to hear about that. Yeah, so it was initially a meetup group in San Francisco and it was amazing. It was like this kind of secret community group, you know, where these smart women talked about uh, technology, were in the tech industry. It was a place to feel as though you belonged. And what happened um, around a year and a half into uh, the organization um, or the community being around, is the media really started talking about teaching girls to code and teaching women to code. And this is important and, uh, and a, a great story, but if we don't elevate also the needs of um, women, intersectional women in the industry, people who are historically excluded, this incredible conversation about teaching girls to code and teaching women to code was actually a threat to the women in the industry who are already facing the bias of, you know, needing to prove um, their technical skills and being viewed as less technical and assumed to be less technical than they actually were. In many cases, not technical at all. Um, I, one of the stories that really stands out to me is there was a, a woman who, uh, from the Women Who Code community, uh, she was at her booth and she was the only woman at the booth and it was all engineers and one recruiter. Recruiter's name was Brian, and she had people who had. And Brian, by the way, is an ex, is typically um, a name that only men have in the United States. Of course, it's possible um, that uh, that uh, um, a a woman could have that name, but I've I've never met one. And um people were walking up to her and asking her if she was Brian because it was easier to imagine that a woman was named Brian than that she was one of the engineers at the table um so that's that's really like overcoming uh kind of uh, a, a really strong bias um you know day to day throughout throughout your uh career and so elevating the needs of the women in the industry um, just was clearly very important. And then I, I personally have um, a, a strong focus on um, an international approach that's always been important to me. So uh, one of the first uh, cities that we expanded to was outside of the United States. And so um, being in 134 countries is, um, and and all of Women Who Code's programming being either free or scholarship accessible has been um, kind of a, a core value of, of the organization since the beginning. That's really amazing. Uh, like, uh, I love to see as well, pro like community programs like this and community meetups kind of spaces that you can have to share openly your experience mm -hmm. and connect with others who are going through similar experiences or may have like, um, I guess experience like things to share with one another mm -hmm. is so important um and i'd love to hear the inter like the international element obviously uh, within andela we, we're across i think we have engineers now across uh, engineers designers product managers and everything across 80 countries as well so maybe we'll get up to the same number as women who code soon um i did want to touch on that actually like kind of you know the, one of the big purposes of women who code must be around kind of mentorship and meeting other uh, mentors in the space 
Like, can you explain a little bit about how you've seen that work, how people have connected, what impact that has had? Yeah. Um, so it's it's peer mentoring um, and really also elevating role models in the industry. So I feel like as Women Who Code was getting started, you know, the media always talked about Sheryl Sandberg and uh, Marissa Mayer and Ginny Rometty. And it was like, oh, there's no other women in the tech industry. But the reality is there are, you know, so many incredibly talented, incredibly successful women who are in senior positions, have taken different paths to leadership, um, who are really making change in, in the industry. And so one of the key things that we try to do is not only create a sense of belonging within our community where you can connect with other members, but also highlight some of these incredibly talented women who might be 10 levels above you, or they might only be one or two, um, so that you can help to see not only that there are successful um, women in the industry as role models, diverse women, uh, women all over the world, um, but, but to really start to see and imagine your path. And um, there's so many different paths to leadership uh, that you can take with a technical uh, background. Like I said, in the future, I, I think, being at that executive level, um, being a founder of a company, um, being on the board of a company, it's gonna be as critical to have technical knowledge as it historically has been to have you know, financial understanding. Yeah, and I think there's also a little bit playing into that. I, I had a, a, co uh, a colleague, an ex-colleague tell me once that uh, women are more likely to position ourselves as non-technical, even if we do have technical knowledge. and. Uh, how quickly we are to kind of have imposter syndrome around um, our skills in that area, in any particular area, but mm -hmm. particularly in, in technical. And um, so she was a, a computer science uh, teacher, actually, originally, and um, professional. And she was like, say that you, you know how to code. You, you aren't mm -hmm. a professional engineer, but you know how to code. And that's really mm -hmm. important rather than saying, I'm, non te I'm not technical, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, when you think about those kind of specific biases, so one, maybe imposter syndrome um, or, or others that you've encountered regularly or heard women within kind of your community speak about, uh, what are the ones that kind of spring to mind and, and what areas have you seen, what, I guess, what ways have you seen people approach those or break them down and jump over those yeah. barriers? Yeah, I had a, uh, a hiring manager once tell me, um, you know, often when he's interviewing women candidates, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I have um, some experience in this programming language and um, are very delicate about it. And that that hiring manager would dig deeper and find out, oh, they actually were, worked on three projects at their last company using that programming language. <laughs> and and um, he actually I'm said- I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. On the flip side, <laughs> the male candidate will be like, oh yeah, that programming language is, is really easy. I love it. And they'll find out, you know, they, they did a project over the weekend <laughs> on it, which just approaching it like both um, should, should lead with their knowledge, but um, that this hiring manager said, you know, I really have to lean in um, to, to hear um, that, that people are successful. And I, I personally, saw how critical this was. I remember when I first moved to the um, the tech industry and remember I came from the performance wear world. So I was interviewing um, kind of at a company that was the intersection of sport and technology. And I had every qualification on the job description, just like I was in the box making all the mistakes women make. And I sat there in the interview and talked about my experience and I kept saying, yeah, we did this, we did that, and we did this. And at the end of the interview, my interviewer said, Elena, have you done any of this? You keep saying we. And I realized that I wasn't positioning my experience strongly enough. And I had a really strong career and a lot of experience and every, every uh, skill on, on the job description. And it, it really helped me to personally understand what um, what barriers like our, our cultural expectations and we're putting in front of ourselves uh, 
ourselves that um, that we can, you know, work to overcome, but also educate the industry that it's a little more difficult for women to talk about their career successes. And it's a little bit more difficult for society to hear us do that. And at Women Who Code, that's um, a, a, an a kind of an important program that we have that we are constantly trying to get people to celebrate, you know, those small successes, like, and honestly, in, dro please drop in the chat, like give yourself an applaud. Did you um, get a promotion? Did you launch uh, a beautiful, uh, you know, piece of code in the past couple of months? Did you work on a project? Did you, um, you know, contribute an idea that that made a difference? Did you give a talk? You know, something that is um, the kind of things that are happening maybe once a week, you know, maybe once a month, maybe every six months. But it's if we don't feel confident in, in owning our successes, um, the world won't do it for us. And I realized how critical it was, not only in my own experience, but I was talking to a director of engineering at a company and she said, oh, Elena, you're right. I'm senior director of engineering now and I've actually been embarrassed to update my LinkedIn profile. And that was like a mic drop moment for me because you know, she had a contract, she had a pay increase, she had a title, she had so many things legitimizing this career success that she had but she was still hesitant to bring it forward. So if, um, if like people, um, if women are, are forgetting to say, you know, I contributed to that project, I, I helped that succeed or don't feel comfortable, or if, if when they do it, they're penalized by uh, society and culture, um, we, we we have work to do and so that's um you know just one of those things that uh a bias that that we should be working to break and that you know at, at women who code uh we are working to break and I'm, I'm very passionate about it that's amazing and I think like the way you framed it is like there's kind of the individual of like what we as women can do you know mm -hmm. positioning ourselves being more confident and owning our achievements mm -hmm. um and standing over that but there's also like that kind of societal piece so I, we need to understand um that sometimes you need a little bit of a nudge to do those things um mm -hmm. how, how would you say how would you approach that um i guess from the more macro perspective right within a company or maybe actually if, if uh, for our meal uh, colleagues or uh, on Dellen's on the call, like what could they do so, to support uh, female colleagues and women colleagues? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think just being reflective about the biases that exist. So I had um, uh, a male manager say that before he submitted his team reviews, he would actually do it and then go back and read it for, for biases. And so, um, you know, he had this bias that this woman who was a mom who, you know, left a little bit early, um, is that person actually committed to the role? But when, when going back and reflecting on it, he realized, oh, he has, you know, two men on his team who are also fathers who are also leaving around that same time and isn't caring for that that bias um, for them and could adjust that link that uh, that language in the review and the same for um, you know uh, every other piece of it another thing that I think is important to do is to um, help amplify the successes of um, of the women on your team so whether no matter what your gender is, this is something that you can do because it is harder for women to talk about their career successes themselves and advocate for themselves. If you help to advocate, hey, um, you know, Rosa um, really made a, a difference here. Um, you know, congratulations. Or, you know, I typically see people asking for a promotion once they've accomplished what you've accomplished. I see that there's you know, this available, have you considered, have you considered doing it? And, um, you know, these, these little tiny things um, that you can kind of 
do echo successes and you know create that as as a culture like the the uh, applaud <laughs> culture is something that um we talk about at women who go that you know sharing out yours and other successes um and i've, I've definitely heard uh other companies start to uh advocate for that and, and bring that into their own teams internally amazing that's fantastic yeah and i think some great advice um here uh, my team like to do snaps <laughs> for, yeah. for everybody as they're going through but um i think i think that's pretty amazing one thing you did mention actually around the kind of reviews and, and biases so yesterday we were having a conversation around remote work uh, mm -hmm. uh at one of our events and actually um the kind of idea that remote work builds more trust or you have to you know put more trust in your teams mm -hmm. it's about taking back your flexibility and you know if you are a parent or a carer or uh, anything, it's about outputs, not maybe how you look or um, kind of being a, a bit of a leveler um, in terms of remote work. What, what do you, what's your kind of opinion around remote work and maybe how that will uh, either attract or do you think maybe, uh, maybe it will detract women uh, mm -hmm. being attracted to the technology industry or, or sticking around? Yeah, so um, kind of two of the things that um, we were hearing already before COVID from our community is that um, paid leave and flexible hours were some of the most critical uh, benefits for them to have at an organization. And so um, fl like flexibility, the world has been forced to be flexible. And I do think that it's it's very important for us to not assume that it's what it always was before. It's the way it can be going forward. Um, but I, I think it has a huge opportunity to be a leveler in the tech industry because can you imagine how much privilege you have to have to be able to move to a tech hub, whether that is um, uh, you know San Francisco or London or Dublin or New York or Lagos or you know wherever it is um, that happens to be the tech center of of your country or um uh your area to to be able to perform um your role to the best of your ability and the place that is right for you and right for your family um is creates a lot of potential and i think um you know organizations like andela really show us also that you know, this should be happening, not just, you know, in, in the Valley, not just in the United States, not just in Europe, this should be happening all over the world. And that you can continue to um, build up and, uh, you know, become a, a global talent network, and making sure that, you know, we are adapting our, our practices to, to continue to look for ways to drive more inclusion. Um, you're always taking steps, uh, kind of imperfect steps forward. And so this amazing moment that we're in, which has like been horrible and hard and tragic for us all, it's also presented us with opportunity to not do things the way we have always done in the past. And I had a board member say to me, you know, most of business practices have been developed by like predominantly men, predominantly white, historical um, ways of doing things. And we don't have to do them the same going forward. There's no reason that that was the best or right way to do it. And so changing um, that is an opportunity, completely shifting the way that we do things can drive more equity. But what we want to make sure is that it doesn't reduce the equity. And so we always have to be looking for every decision that we make, you know, how, how are we wrong? Every step we move forward, you know, what new problems has it created that we now need to, to solve for? And, um, and so I, I, I think there's a, a lot of opportunity and I, I honestly, we should, we should flip and have, have your input because Andel is really going to be a, um, a thought leader in how to make remote work work um and um and these are things that companies need to be uh thinking about and participating in right now 
I 100% agree, Elena. I think, you know, diversity of perspectives and thought is always going to make A, like better sense for what you're building, product, the business, whatever it is, um, but also B for the team, right? Um, it's so important to have, be challenged in what you're doing, but also like not really conforming to this one, one view, which maybe has been the way in the past. Um, like, as you said, many practices, things have been created by predominantly men and board seats or whatever that happens to be. And mm-hmm. now we have this chance to, to really open it up and um, I guess work together in terms of how do we bring that diversity of thought and, and opinion geographically, um, across gender uh, and I think it's really really exciting absolutely um, so I think then I have maybe like one or two more questions I do want to remind everyone as well because there's lots of chat going on and particularly loving a bit of mentoring and cheerleading uh, between Gemma and Peculiar mm-hmm. I love it um, but I do want to remind you that the Q&A is there so do feel free to pop uh, some questions in um, I have one or two more for you, Elena, uh, before we move to that. So um, I think as well as being the CEO of Women of Code, who we, which we've talked about a lot, um, you're also an angel investor and venture partner. Um, so I'd love mm-hmm. to hear a little bit about that and, um, and the impact that women founders are having maybe as well and your perspective on, on that side of things. Yeah. Um, so I, I also just recently took on um, a scouting role with Picos Capital, which is a, a German uh, investment firm. Um, uh, Valor Ventures is amazing and I've gotten to uh, be part of that and I'm very passionate about it because within their thesis, um, they also are particularly dedicated to um, examining uh, pitches from women and historically excluded uh, communities. and. So, but but it's still there, focused in on the southeast. And so, working with um, you know Picos allows me to uh, broaden to a, a global view and and look at um, investments that are um, you know outside of the southeast as well. Um, you know, we we know that um, women, we know that minorities are um, not receiving investment uh, at the same rate. I, I personally um, have. Um, done most of my angel investments in women-led organizations and a couple, just a couple of them have not. And I will tell you from my, um, my very limited experience, um, the, the women-led organizations are amazing <laughs> and doing really, really well. And, um, and I've seen uh, strong success there. So, um, you know, going outside of what is um, historically normal or um, what uh, um, what who who would typically get investment uh, has has definitely paid off. And you know, for Strong Capital put out a report a few years ago that they saw um, much higher returns for companies that had women founders on the the founding team. And then, you know, fast forward we see at the um, you know, Fortune 500 level, like big organizations, we have women represented on the executive team and board seats that the ROI is higher. So from, from founding, from startups to, um, to major corporations, um, being inclusive um, makes, makes sense from a, an ROI perspective. Um, I, um, I, I, um, and, and personally very passionate about, um, you know, looking for ways to, um, you know, help uh, women get access to, to capital. And so while it's, it's definitely not my, my full-time role, when the opportunity presents itself and I, you know, I try to keep a few uh, other venture uh, firms and investors uh, in mind so that, you know, if it isn't inside the thesis of either um, Valor or Picos that I'm able to pass it on to someone else who might be able to either give them connections or um, or support them to to as actual investors. Amazing. And for any women who are looking to kind of start businesses and maybe find something and try mm-hmm. to, I guess, get funding in that kind of way, mm-hmm. what, what kind of general advice, depending on, you know, wherever someone might live, 
would you give to 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 those women? Yeah. So uh, if you're looking for for venture investment, it's also often not just for money. Uh, it creates connections and it creates also uh, people with with power who have an interest in your organization succeeding. So um, picking people who have connections, you know, if you are a med tech company who have connections within um, your potential um, customer base or um, uh, production experience, picking uh, um, venture capitalists that are actually going to be right for your organization uh, is is another reason that's important. On, on the flip side, is venture capitalists often they they want to see an outcome, so they want to see you IPO, they want to see you get acquired. These are all fantastic outcomes, but you have to decide. Uh, what's what's best for your organization, but um, having um, money to be able to uh, reach your goals faster, grow quickly is great, but also having the the connections and support of um, and social credibility. Um, you know, if you have a top venture firm who's invested in you, you can say, you know, um, like we took Sequoia's money or, you know, um, you know, if you if you go through an accelerator like Y Combinator, you have access to all of their uh, alumni who've gone through it. And there's been many incredibly successful um, uh, uh, tech companies, and um, like I, I went through YC, and we have one or two um, unicorn, it's a billion dollar valuation organizations um, who went through it with us, and. So you get access to that network, the social credibility, but also the organization itself working to help you be more successful. Amazing, that's perfect, Lana. Oh, great. So last question before we move to the audience q and is, you know, if you were to give uh, the women on this call a takeaway of something to keep in their mind, whether that be a tip to break bias, mm -hmm. a mindset, they should take and um, what what would you say uh, for people who are trying to make technology their career and want to stay in stay in this area yeah i would say um when there's something that you want like if you want to get a promotion or you um aren't aren't something isn't meeting your expectations you know tell the people around you tell your manager tell um hr because what often happens is, uh, especially for women, because that bias exists, and they might not have even imagined that that's the path that you want to take. And, um, you know, often people actually are willing to and do want to help you. And if you're coming up against a wall um, where you aren't getting support, um, start looking elsewhere because there are a tremendous number of, um, of uh, job opportunities for technologists right now. The market is uh, underrepresented. And so make sure, you know, if there's a project that you wish you were working on, tell someone. If there's a promotion that you want to know how to get, tell them. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but ask them, what do I need to do to be able to, um, you know, be part of this decision next time? Um, and uh, also start thinking ahead. So not just the next promotion, but the one after that, because you are actually working towards all of your future promotions today. Sure, thank you, Elena. I think that's really, really great advice to take away. Great, I'm gonna hop to the Q&A. So if anyone does have any questions, just hit the Q&A button and you can type it in. We will answer live or we'll type some answers. I have uh, one question around actually, Dealing with aggression in the workplace, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, uh, being a woman and perhaps having a manager or or similar, um, being more aggressive in their in their tone towards you and um, not taking your ideas into consideration. I think you know that kind of uh, behavior can can, as we talked about earlier, can be over time. Maybe smaller microaggressions, perhaps. Um, how would you? what would your advice be in general in those situations um maybe where it is like over time or your ideas aren't being taken on board what would you suggest for for this person yeah so um 
there's kind of two different approaches with this. Aggressive is actually a bias term that women get assigned when they're being assertive. So if this is if you're being told you're aggressive, um, you you might just be voicing your opinions in a way that um, uh, is being received as aggressive, um, and it it's uh, an experience that hopefully you won't externalize, and we can work to uh, overcome that bias. On the flip side, is I've also heard from women. Um, like that, you know, people shout so loud and um, are, are, you know, so aggressive that they start to wonder like, you know, do I want to be part of this industry? Uh, I don't want to shout in a, in a meeting. I don't want to, um, to have to push forward um, my voice in a way that, um, you know, feels so, so strong and aggressive. I want to do my work. I want to uh, be a thought leader. I want to help make decisions. I want to help this company succeed. Um, but I don't want to fight with my colleagues. And, and so I think that is um, also a double standard where if women were to match that, um, they'd be penalized in ways that, um, that their, their male counterparts won't. And we also, um, you know, we reward our, ours, many of our, our cultures reward when, men for having the loudest, the strongest, the most aggressive voice um, and penalize women for it. Um, so culturally, you'll, you'll have more men that feel comfortable in that space and have um, developed that as a personality trait and more women who, um, who aren't comfortable with it, don't want to match it because they, they have experienced throughout their lives that they, they will, um, um, that it won't work the same way for them. And so uh, for, for those individuals, I would say, remembering that, um, that, that this exists because of, um, you know, cultural biases um, that exist in the world and um, making sure that you're building connections that remind you, you do belong in this industry, that it's amazing and it's better with you in it, and um, again, just taking those those small steps forward um, to try to uh, break down um, um, and and shift culture to be uh, a more inclusive space. Um, yeah, I love that. That's amazing. We have a lot of questions flowing in now. So, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a question uh, from Grace about. Um, Figuring out your path and how mm -hmm. how you might do that, uh, like where to. You spoke earlier about path to leadership it can come in many forms. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I guess different. There are many different options and career options open within the technology industry itself. You know, mm -hmm. you may go from a software engineer to a product manager, that kind of stuff. How how would you suggest navigating that? Yeah, um, so I would I would. And in this like day and age where things are so connected, um, talk to people who are in those roles, talk to them about um, why they love um, doing what they're doing. And, um, and you know, you know, not necessarily always reaching out to someone who's so far ahead, but someone who's maybe just like one step beyond where you are, two steps beyond. Uh, talk to them about um, how they got there, ask them, you know, in this day and age of, of, of Zoom and LinkedIn and, you know, Twitter, you can connect with people so easily. Ask them to connect with you for five, sorry, like 10, 15 minutes, have a few questions, you know, write them a thank you at the end. Um, if you are interested in potentially working at their company, ask them if, you know, you know, if I ever saw a job opening that fit my um, my skills or what I was looking for, would you be willing to, you know, pass my, um, like, give me a referral. And by doing that really slowly, you know, just building it up over time, you, you'll, you'll find them meeting friends because they're also smart people in the industry who um, uh, have interests that um, are, are similar to, to yours because you're reaching out to people who are specifically at, at companies and in roles that you're excited about. And it'll help you to figure out um, what companies 
are supporting their team members, what companies you actually want to be working for. Amazing. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think talking to people on, on finding, not even mentors, but just having those conversations, exploratory mm -hmm. conversations is absolutely critical for sure. Um, so we have a question about imposter syndrome, <laughs> uh, which is, I, I mean, I didn't ask it earlier on, but we did speak about it, but I think very directly, like how would you advise overcoming imposter syndrome? What things do you think that practically we, uh, women could do? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I have it too. <laughs> um, I, when I first stepped up as CEO of Women Who Code, I was like, so shy to call myself a CEO that every time I got on a stage, I would say, my name's Elena Percival and I'm CEO of Women Who Code. And I remember I said it once at this event um, at GitHub's offices and everyone started like cheering. And I was like, wow, people, people believe me, people, people support that this is, <laughs> is true. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I forced myself just to acknowledge it over and over again. And I, I think acknowledging that, um, that the uh, imposter syndrome exists. And, um, and, and honestly, like I, I, often worked with people who I thought were like so much further along in, in certain areas. And, you know, we're, we're all moving, <laughs> we're all moving and learning. And honestly, if you aren't, you know, 40% behind in whatever role you're in, probably not learning anyway. And it probably means it's time for you to move on and start to have imposter syndrome all over again. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And like in the spirit of lifelong learning, uh, mm -hmm. keeping keeping going. Amazing answer. Thank you, Elena. And then a great one from Gemma as well. Um, in our conversation, she said, it seems that putting yourself out there is is very important. Um, how does one per one do it without coming off arrogant or overconfident? Or should we just train ourselves to uh, stop caring or care less about what people think? What do you think yeah. for Gemma? Yeah, so um, I think that's going back to the sort of applaud, like mentioning your your successes, and that you know it actually is harder for us to do it, um, but but practicing it um, and um, you know not necessarily rattling off the the ten things that you've done if you're you're not in um, in a you know requesting your your promotion or going over over your reviews keep your own brag book to, to remind yourself of all of the incredible uh, successes that you're doing. And um, when, when you get the opportunity, you know, say to your manager, like, hey, um, I feel like this went really well this week. Um, I'm so excited about uh, what I was able to, to do to help this happen. Um, you know, I'd love to look for, for more opportunities to continue having uh, a big impact on the organization, or um, I'd love to hear about the, the types of things that I can be doing to help me get promoted to lead on a project or to, um, you know, what, whatever um, um, level it is. And then also, you know, find, find people to help be allies who will, um, who, will shout out your successes for you because you're not going to be penalized for someone else shouting your successes um, the way it can come off, as you said, as, as arrogant or boastful um, when you're, when you are doing it for yourself. Yeah, it's amazing. I, another actually fellow, fellow uh, female leader at Andela, uh, we were talking near the beginning of this year and uh, sometimes you can also get so busy and like, mm -hmm. you know, you're constantly achieving things or doing things, mm -hmm. but you don't realize because you never take the time to pause and look back and uh, we were talking about you know having our own little pat on the back brag doc mm -hmm. where you can just like throw down these are all the things I'm really proud of and sometimes you kind of just don't realize the things that you have achieved um yourself and to start even vocalizing them later until after after you kind of take that reflection moment as well um mm -hmm. so I love that you mentioned that as well um great so uh Another question from Grace, which I think is fantastic. 
And I think this will be probably our last one, unfortunately, and I am, but I think mm-hmm. it's a great one to end, uh, end on it. So how, uh, in, in an environment where sometimes women are, are underestimated, but when you, you get that promotion, you become the CEO of Women Who Code, or you kind of take that step, um, and you're, you're kind of there and you, you have to prove it, how do you handle the, how have you personally handled like the expectations maybe that are on your shoulders or like the things that you have to deliver um and yeah and just kind of try to maintain some balance as well once you've put yourself out there you've got it you've got what you wanted uh how would you give advice around that um yeah i i don't think it's different um than taking on any any new role um and you know, actually moving into a leadership role, um, I thought before I was here that that meant you were the person in charge, but actually my role is to serve my team and help them be successful. And, um, and, and, you know, when there's a gap, it's, it's me who, who it falls back on to, to fill. And um, so I actually find more trouble finding the balance because I'm also going from being a a smaller organization to a slightly bigger organization. Um, I'm going through the challenge of being kind of a doer role to pulling up and only um, setting other people up for doing and succeeding. And, you know, I used to be at a tiny company where I knew everything that was going on and now it's a little bit bigger and I don't know everything that's going on and so um building building your team helping them succeed helping drive clarity around um what what the strategy is what the goal is um and and leaning on um on that has has been really important for me but it was actually realizing um that your your goal as the leader isn't isn't to accomplish the goals your goal is to serve um the people on your team make sure that they can reach the organization's goals that's amazing elena um thank you so much for your time your thoughts uh all the advice that you've given today uh it's honestly been really wonderful uh to chat with you and uh i love everything that women who code do so i wish you and the whole organization massive success uh in the future Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined online. Uh, the chat has been absolutely blowing up, which I love. Um, you can join the Andela community. So just go to community.andela.com to continue the conversation and uh, meet some other like-minded Andellans out there. Uh, we would love to see you. You can get some career advice. You can connect with other, um, other kind of technologists out there. And of course, yes, join the Women Who Code events. I'm sure there's one near nearby for sure. Um, We're all digital you. now, so it's near everyone. <laughs> near everybody. Amazing. Um, I love the world of hybrid events. It means you can talk to anyone all over the world. But thank you, Elena. Um, and we hope to talk with you maybe soon again. Um, and thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining and sharing your time with us today. Hi everyone. Ooh, have a great evening, morning, night. Mm-hmm.